when I was a lot younger, one of my earliest memories is the idea of me and my father locked up in a bedroom. You might be wondering to yourself what this whole thing is about. Uh, well, <laughs> what we actually were doing was actually we, were, we lived in a three-room apartment and one of the things that, uh, what, what we would do was that my dad and I would spend the evening uh, developing photos and what we would do is that I would uh, put a blanket across the windows and cloth down the lures and she would take out all this equipment and my basic job was to put the photos into the chemicals, throw them into a pail of water and then dry them. And what was really amazing were all the images that eventually came out from those photos. Okay, this is me. Okay, and I want to tell you that this is the very same camera that uh, is there. Okay, and what's really interesting is that uh, one of the first things that my dad did was that he taught me a, lo a lot about photography, but one of the, uh, what he first taught me about was the idea of focus. And I grew up with this idea of focus all the time. People are constantly telling us, be focused, stay focused. If you have a problem, start a focus group discussion. Correct, right? That's going to solve the problem. Why do we need to be so focused? Well, people tell us because, well, there are so many distractions. There are so many distractions in the world. Okay? You need to be clear about what you want. Once you are, are clear about what you want, then you have purpose, you have direction, you know exactly what, uh, where you're heading. Okay? The other reason why a lot of people tell us why we need to be focused it's because they say, there's no time to do everything. You need to understand what is important to you. And as a result of that, you're going to have determination, you will believe, and you will succeed because you have focus. Now, I'm just thinking to myself, imagine if all our photos were sharp and in focus. You know something? That's what's happening in a lot of our photos nowadays because when we use an iPhone or we use a camera that's uh, set to automatic, this is the result. Uh, Photograph that is uh, in hyperfocus, which basically means that it's in focus from the beginning all the way to the end. Okay? And I was thinking to myself, wouldn't it be interesting if we asked ourselves the question, uh, why do we get pictures like this? Which are more interesting, right? I mean, they are so much more interesting than this. Okay? Uh, this, these are accidents. When I'm, when, when I'm trying to catch my daughter running around and I pen the photograph, I get pictures like this. And I get a picture like this, which is so much more interesting than the photos that I usually get. And that's, the that's, that's where this talk began. I asked myself, is there any value in us being purposefully unfocused? Okay? Note the word purposefully unfocused. Okay? And so I asked a photographic friend of mine, and he said, well, there's actually a term. The term is called bokeh. Now, it's a Japanese term. You are, all you have to say is okay, and put a B in front of it, and you're going to get bokeh. Okay? And uh, bokeh basically means haze. It refers to the aesthetic blur quality of a photograph. Okay. Not the blur or the amount of blur, but the feel of the blur. Now, you might say to yourself, that sounds interesting because next time your teacher tells you, oh, why are you so blur? You say, no, I'm not blur. I'm okay. You know? <laughs> because it's the character of whatever blur is there. We don't know what blur is there. Whatever blur is there is, is part of it. But what is interesting is that it is in intentionally out of focus. It is being intentionally out of focus. So let me give you an example of that. This is from the movie Oblivion. This is an example of bokeh in the movies. Shallow focus, a narrow depth of field, and what happens is that it brings attention to and emphasizes the main subject. Okay? So there is a reason why the photograph is actually out of focus. However, photographic, photographers tell me that there are two kinds of bokeh. There's good bokeh and there's bad bokeh. Good bokeh is when the bokeh is pleasing to the eye, and bad bokeh is when it's actually unattractive or distracting or unpleasant to the actual subject itself. Okay? So again from Oblivion, look at this picture. What's happening is that Tom Cruise and Olga are seeing each other for the first time in the midst of strangers. And there's a reason why they're doing this, because amidst all the strangers, they're actually seeing each other, right? It's the, sh it's the shooting situation, therefore, that actually influences bokeh. Now I want you to remember these three things, okay? Number one, bokeh actually emphasizes the main subject. Number two, there are two kinds of bouquet, good bouquet and bad bouquet. And the third one is that bouquet arises from the situation. I want to talk about this concept using three paradigms. And I'm going to start off with my first paradigm by, by, by first suggesting the idea that we are actually caught between two worlds. Okay? We are caught between a world of focus and a world of possibilities. Okay? A world of possibilities. What's behind that blurred area in that photograph? Okay? So this world of possibilities is created by a world of serendipity, opportunity, and novelty. And my suggestion today is that what is peripheral may actually prove itself important, if not more important, 
in making what remains in focus even more beautiful or meaningful. Okay, so let us start off with my first, first paradigm. My first paradigm is the idea of serendipity. How does serendipity mean? Serendipity basically means a happy accident or a pleasant surprise. The accident of finding something good or useful while not specifically searching for it. And this happens most of the time when we're looking for rainbows. Right? It's raining, we're looking for rainbows. And whenever we're looking for rainbows, we never see a rainbow. Right? When we look up, we say, hey, rainbow! Right? Uh, and it's really when we uh, are not looking for it that it actually happens to us. That's serendipity. I was driving along uh, New Zealand uh, in February, and I was trying to get to Rotorua. I was driving at about 100 kilometers per hour. Okay? Uh, and I was really very focused on my driving. But as I was driving uh, past a field, this was what I saw. And I couldn't help it, I had to stop. I stopped in the middle of the highway, I got out and I had to take this photo. Okay? And what, what am I trying to get at? I, I didn't expect this, I didn't expect this. Uh, and if I had been so focused on getting to Rotorua, I wouldn't have taken this photo. Sometimes it helps if we stop and ask ourselves, whether our focus is, whether, is, is what we really want to be focusing on. Okay? So let me give you an idea of what I mean. Most of the time, our ideas don't come when we are actually looking for it. Ideas come when we're not looking for it. Okay? Sometimes when you have a problem, you say to yourself, I need to solve this problem. Most of the time, uh, you can sit down there, you can churn, you can churn, and you think, 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 I, how am I going to solve this problem? The solution will never come. Then what you do is that you go for a bath, or you're washing your dishes, and you think, oh, yeah. That's, 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 that's exactly it. That's my idea, right? right? That's, that's the solution to my problem. What I'm trying to get is that sometimes if you're so focused, we are actually not solving the problem itself. It's only when we are not thinking about the problem or not thinking about the idea that the idea actually comes. Okay? What is interesting is that 33% to 50% of all scientific di discoveries were actually unexpected. You know, they didn't really expect to discover something and they actually found out something. Okay? Think about what happens in our lives. Most of the time, we are Googling something, right? We think to ourselves, uh, I really don't know, I really want to find out about, about this particular thing. So I Google it. And when we Google something, we find things which we didn't expect. Now, on one hand, we are getting distracted from what we actually want to do. But when we find things that we don't expect, this actually creates opportunities and discoveries of learning that we never expected that we were going to learn. Okay? So what am I suggesting is that we sometimes chance on something else that is interesting or encounter a new learning opportunity or, or a piece of information that may actually enhance our understanding of this subject. So let me give you an example. I teach literature. If I just teach Shakespeare and I, teach Shakespeare and I read Shakespeare all the time, okay, fine, I, I understand literature. But the beauty of literature, of course, is that if I read something that's about history, about geography, about psychology, about philosophy, about sociology, even something about pop culture, even something that I find on Facebook, right? all the pictures and all the nonsense that I get on Facebook, somehow or other, it gets related back to what I am studying. Okay? And what's the result of that? I leave the textbook. I forget about the textbook for a while, and instead of reading about the subject, I'm reading around the subject. I'm interested to find out new things, and I will actually learn and find out more than I actually expected to learn. So let me just tell you a little bit more myself. I was in one of the top junior colleges okay, in Singapore, and uh, what happened was that I was very distracted. Yeah, I'm, I'm the kind of person who can't sit down for three hours and study. I'm the kind of person who tries to study and go, oh, squirrel, you know, <laughs> the kind of thing. So, uh, so I didn't do very well. Okay, so at the end of my, uh, my, my time in junior college, this was the results that I got. I got a CEE. Okay? So I thought to myself, what am I going to do with myself? I, I, went, I, I joined the army. So while I was in the army, I decided to uh, do my A-levels again. One hand carrying the M16 and the other hand carrying a book. Do you think I did better? Come on, give me a break. I did better. Of course I did better. <laughs> <laughs> I got a B. Okay? So I decided to myself, okay, I've got the gift of the gap. I might as well just become a teacher. So by default, I joined teaching. And while I was teaching uh, in, in IE, I decided to take my A-levels for the third time. Crazy, right? Studying IE and then uh, doing my literature at the same time. Uh, there were no textbooks, uh, all the literature texts have changed, okay? so it was really, really tough. But serendipity allowed me to get an ABC. So after two years of teaching in primary school, I ended up in university. Okay? I, was, I, I went to NUS. I thought to myself, I must be, I must be one of the, the worst students around. I have to, I have to try three times before, before I can even get to NUS. Okay? What was really interesting was that uh, when I got back my first essay, 
it was an A. So I got my A for my first essay and I said to myself, hmm, maybe this is possible. I can actually do this. And what eventually happened was that at the end of first year, I was third for the entire faculty of arts and social science. And I topped either language or literature for all four years of my study, including honors year. Now, that's serendipity because I didn't expect it. Okay? This is something that I didn't expect. The only question right now is the question of once serendipity, serendipity hits us, do we have what we need to take advantage of that opportunity? Okay? Which brings me to my second point. Okay? I've got serendipity and now the opportunity is arising. Do I actually take advantage of that? Now, I, I need to tell you that this is the camera that you're very used to. But the camera has actually changed. This is an uh, original camera, the way it looked. There used to be a time when we actually had to fit bulbs into flashes. Okay, this is the Polaroid. This was the Kodak box camera. I don't even know if any of you have even seen something like that. This is the Canon Nexus. Okay, and now of course the Canon, uh, the camera is even not not even a camera, right? It's a handphone. Change happens all the time, but change is also a catalyst of growth and opportunity. Now the thing, of course, is that if you say to yourself, "I'm not going to change. I'm just going to stay where I am," then you're going to get stagnant. So what? What's going to happen is that younger generations like my daughter is going to catch up with you. Why? Because they have the flexibility and adaptability to change with the times. Okay? Just look at the way children adapt to situations. I didn't have to teach my daughter how to use an iPhone. She figured that she needed to swipe and she touched things and things were going to happen on the iPhone. Okay? She's always ready to move out of her comfort zones. She's ready to learn from her bigger sister about, and she's playing Minecraft right now. Is it Minecraft? Right? building houses and everything and I'm like, I don't even know what you're doing. You know what I mean? It's amazing, okay? And this results because children have a very natural mindset of exploration and adventure. Something that I think many of us have lost. Okay, the idea that there's, there's no limits. Let's just do whatever comes along and, and, and we'll try it, okay? Now in the old days, we used to have cameras with 24 or 36 exposures, okay? We had a film with only 24 shots, okay? In a situation like that, every shot counts. Every time I, I'm, taking, I, I'm going for a tour or something like that, I need to make sure that I have 36 shots. And I'm only going to make sure I have 36 shots. Now, this is something that you guys don't understand. Because with digital cameras, you can just take anything, right? Take whatever I want and then I'll pick out the best, which, which is the one that I like. Now, you must also understand that uh, when I used to take photos in the old days, it took one week before I actually saw the prints. You know? You guys take a photo, you look, oh, not nice, let's take again. Right, right? Can you imagine what it's like? You take a shot, you do not know how it looked, and what will happen, of course, is that if you miss that moment, that, sh that shot is forever gone. Imagine the pressure taking photos for a friend's wedding. You know, you're changing film. Ha, huh, your kiss already, uh, that's it, gone. Okay, the moment, is, the moment is gone. The thing, of course, is that with digital cameras, the possibilities of many right answers are there. I can just choose uh, taking a picture and I've got so many possibilities. Which is the best? Which is the, which is the best photo that I'm going to be taking? And as a result of that, I want you to understand that when you take photos, you don't, you're not afraid. I want you to see the analogy that that's exactly the way life is right now. Okay? There are so many possibilities out there. Why are you still focused on the idea that I have to only take one shot? Okay? So I want to ask you a question. Which picture of the sunset do you like best? This one? This one? Or this one. Now I want you to notice I didn't ask you the question, which is the correct answer? Because there is no correct answer. Are you okay? Each one of them is a different answer. And the idea of course is that there, there's, there's this openness to difference that you guys have today that we never had in our, in, in our time. Life begins at the end of our, comfort zone, of our comfort zone. Be ready and daring to take that step out, to try something which is different. Why? Why not try other different apps when, 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 when all the time you're just playing Candy Crush? You know what I mean? There are so many apps out there. Why are you always playing Candy Crush? Are you with me? Okay, go try something else. So let me continue my little story. Okay, what happened was that I went to NUS. Now, when I graduated from NUS, I said to myself, I could have, uh, I could have gone back to primary school where I was teaching. But I, I told myself, no, I'm not going back to primary school. Let's go try something else. Let's step out of our comfort zone. So I moved from primary school and I started teaching in junior college. I could have gone back to my alma mater, but I said to myself, why do I want to go back there? I want to try something different. So I went to the enemy camp. I went to the other side, okay, the dark side. And, uh, 
And I then go back to my alma mater, and I, and, and I taught there, and I must tell you something, uh, teaching there was educational heaven, you know? I actually told my wife at one point, I'll teach her for free. The, the, the teachers were motivated, the students were fantastic. But what was interesting was that in the year 2000, an opportunity arise, arose, okay? Uh, there was a new junior college they were studying. So I said to myself, wouldn't it be interesting if I started a junior college from scratch, okay? From nothing. Okay, and as a result of that, I joined a brand new co college. I went from rank number one to completely unranked. Are you okay? Finding out what a new junior college is like, and I joined, uh, and I joined Pioneer Junior College as subject head of literature there. Okay? Now, as subject head of literature, I was being groomed to become English HOD. Okay? Coincidentally, serendipity, opportunity, the head of the department of pastoral care and career guidance decided to leave. So I moved from HOD English to pastoral care and career guidance. Okay? doing something which is completely different. So the point I'm trying to get at is that the more you step out of your comfort zone, the more experiences and the more challenges you're going to take up and the more you're going to learn. Okay? Which brings us to one last thing. The idea that when you, I move out in the, of my comfort zone, I'm going to do something completely new. Something that I've never ever done before. Okay? Let me explain to you. Today, everybody is a cameraman. Okay? Everywhere we go, we just take out our handphone and we just take pictures, right? And, and the result of that is that we make the ordinary extraordinary. Everything that's everyday, we make it interesting. The familiar becomes unfamiliar. Uh, something which is completely normal becomes unusual. Okay? We, take, uh, we take photos of anything we want, as many photos of anything we want. Right, right? So we take pictures of things that move. Uh, we take pictures of things that don't move. Uh, most of the time, uh, people pray before we eat. But Singaporeans, we take photo before we eat, correct? Right? We take photo of what we want to eat. Uh, we came home ourselves, correct? And then after that, we load everything up onto Facebook. Okay? That's what we do. And what I'm trying to get is that the ability to take so many photos creates these possibilities of experimentation and exploration that was not available to me when I only had 24 exposures. Okay? That's the difference. Okay? We have the ability now to, to try new things. Now, what is interesting, of course, is that I've, I've seen a few batches of uh, teachers in NIE. And invariably, whenever they go for their first lesson, these teachers are asked, why do you want to teach? Why teach? I got really very tired of that question, you know what I mean? Uh, and at the end of the day, I decided to ask a new question. I decided to ask them the question, if you had the qualifications necessary, or the money or the talent that you needed to do anything in the world, what would you be doing if you were not a teacher? And you know something, what's interesting are the varied responses to that question. Instead of why teach, it's now the idea that I, I want to start a cafe. I would, I would love to be a travel writer. I would, I would love to be a, a, a food blogger. You know, I, 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 I want to do so many other things. And the question I'm trying to get is not the idea that don't teach. You know, uh, when, when, when uh, my, teacher, my, my students come back to me and say, you know, I, I became a teacher because of you. I, I, usually, I usually tell them, didn't I teach you anything? You know what I mean? Uh, the point I'm trying to get is that it's not a question of don't teach. The question is that there are so many possibilities out there. And I want to tell you that that's the same thing for you guys. You guys have so much potential. Your life is ahead of you. There are so many possibilities that you could possibly be doing. Why focus on the things that people are asking you to focus on? Why not ask yourself, what are the things that I really, really want to do? Okay? It is not what I know or I can be or what I want to be, but what else I could try to be and discover about myself. Now, let me try to illustrate this. You know when you're a young kid, you play football in primary school, okay, you play for your school team, and then when you go to secondary school, they say, oh, you play football, ah. good, join the school team, okay? So you're in secondary school football. And when you go to JC, they, they ask, what was the CCA in secondary school? Play football, okay, come, join football uh, in junior college, okay? So guess what? This guy plays football for 10 years. I want to ask you a very simple question. What did he learn? What did he learn playing football for 10 years? Now, if I had my way, what I would do is that I'll get a kid to try different CCAs. Primary school, do band, do be a librarian, be a prefect, be a monitor, go be a scout. And as you grow up, you learn and discover your talents and your skills, which may have been latent. How would you not know that this footballer could have been a fantastic musician? or the world's best tennis player. You wouldn't have known it because he spent 10 years playing football. Now, hang on a minute. Some of you might be saying to yourself, are you then trying to say, uh, should we be a specialist or a generalist? No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that. 
what I'm, what I'm not suggesting is that we be jack of all trades and masters of none. What I am suggesting is why not be a jack of all trades and a master of one? Isn't that a possibility? There are, there, are, there are so many possibilities in the world that we are ignoring when we are just focusing on one thing. And the point I'm trying to get at is that this diversity of activities should be encouraged. It should be something that you should be doing in your life. Okay? So let me continue with my little story. Okay? So what eventually happened was that I graduated, okay? uh, I became HOD, but I wasn't just satisfied with having a family and a career. I said to myself, I, I need to continue my studies. And so I diversified. I took the idea of actually doing my master's and my doctorate part-time. Okay? And as a result of that, I was able to join NIE as a lecturer. Now, while I was a HOD or PCCG, I used to give motivational talks to my students uh, in junior college. And I said to myself, why not try doing these this motivational talks in other junior colleges? Okay? So, I wrote to some junior colleges and they said, why don't, why don't you come over and, 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 and do, the junior, do, do this motivational talk for me? Now, Serendipity suggested that one of these places would be Victoria Junior College. An NI student suggested that I come here and the novelty is that I'm here doing a TED talk. Something that I never ever thought I would be able to do. So think about it, unfocused. Being unfocused suggests that there's, there are distractions in the world. But every one of these distractions is a potential discovery or opportunity. There's no time to do everything, and that's precisely why I want to do everything, or as much as I can do. Okay? My dad used to tell me that the camera eye is not discerning, which basically means don't just look at the subject, look at the background and see what's going on. There might be a pole or something sticking out of her head. And this is a photo that I took, which was incredible. Here's an elephant standing on her head, and we didn't even know it until we took that photo. Okay, so don't just look at what's there, look at what's around, what's, what's, what's unfocused. You know, tourists are very interesting. We just take photos of anything that's happening, you know. We, we take photos of the bus, we take photos of anything, and this is my mother-in-law at a market. You know, she likes to go shopping. She has to make a choice. She has to make a choice on what to focus on. What is she going to bring back home to Singapore? Are you okay? I want to tell you something that we have to make the same choice, okay? What are we focusing on? If a child comes back with 96 marks upon 100, do we focus on the 4 marks that she got wrong or the 96 marks that she got right? Okay? Do we focus on the Maserati that's going down the road or do we focus on the people who actually need our help in, in Singapore? Do we focus on our study so much that we have forgotten about our parents who are in the background? So should we be thinking about moving our focus? So instead of focusing on a topic, ask yourself, what is fading in the background? How can it enhance or give meaning to what I'm doing? And then find a balance between the focus and the unfocus and try to appreciate both sides. Now, the paradox of photos is that we take photos in order to keep memory, okay, in the past. But sometimes we look at photos so much that we forget about what's in the present, okay? And the last thing that my father told me was that you really have to enjoy yourself. Learn to enjoy yourself, okay? And I've had fun doing this, and I hope that you have fun listening to me. Thank you very much. I'm done.